Hello, I'm Frank Talbot, Head of Investment Research at CityWire. Welcome to this third and final session of today's event. We've saved the best till last, and we're going to try and tackle the very small topic of sustainable investment. We have three delightful guests joining me to discuss. First up, we have Muna Abu Habsa, co-head of fund investment due diligence at HSBC Wealth and Personal Banking. Then on screen, also dialing in from London, is Sarika Goel, Sustainable Investment Manager Research at Mercer. Then last but not least, we have Jerry Goldberg, CEO and co-founder of GYL Financial Synergies, who is dialing in from Connecticut. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, as ever, it's going to be a 30 to 35 minute session, uh, then 10 to 15 minutes at the end for Q&A from you, the audience. Please submit your questions uh, using the chat function on the right hand side of your screen as and when you have them, and we'll try to address them at the end. Getting back on topic though, uh, I've personally never seen an explosion of interest in a particular investment theme or cohort of investment vehicles on the level that we've seen in ESG investments over the past couple of years. Everything from product launches right through to traffic and engagement on our websites, and of course, the fund flows. Uh, at this point, you'd be forgiven for thinking the entire industry is now ESG. What I'm hearing though is that this is bringing with it some real opportunities, but also headaches as our understanding is continually evolving. Performance was until the middle of last year very strong. Uh, things have certainly tapered off uh, and they were hit in the latest sell-off. So it's the first real challenge since the start of the pandemic. Today, I really wanna get your insights as fund selectors into the area, what your current thinking is, the areas you're seeing real development and equally where you think it might be lacking. Muna, I'll come to you first here. ESG means uh, different things to different people. Uh, that's resulted in a diverse product mix out there in the market trying to serve those needs. What are the conversations you're like, having like with clients? Sure. Um, so, you know, as I was saying, it's it's difficult to get a, a one size fits all in investment. Um, and the same applies to ESG investing. So there's a wide spectrum of environmental, social and governance considerations and the extent to which um, investors will be concerned with those will vary depending on their personal views, um, their investment preferences, their beliefs, their financial goals. Um, and, you know, in a similar vein, asset managers have developed a wide range of uh, products carrying ESG labels, um, which are often um, erroneously referred to as a cohort. Um, but you do need to you know, dig deep to understand the nuances of uh, their approaches, because each, each approach is very different. Um, you know, we're all aware, for example, that a sustainable water fund portfolio is going to look very different um, to an energy transition fund or a diversified best in class um, global equity fund. And, you know, even actually within each of those types of funds, different managers will be looking at ESG through different lenses. Um, what's important for us is to make sure that the products we recommend to clients um, are aligned with our internal group-wide framework and um, you know that defines sustainable investments. Uh, we do have a selective approach, uh, which we can talk about later. Um, but for example, you know, a strategy that's only excluding sectors um, or relying on ESG integration alone or engagement alone um, won't meet our sustainable investing definition. Um, and equally importantly, of course, are the conversations we have with clients and, you know, understanding their um, personal ESG views and, and preferences, um, ensuring that the funds we offer them are well aligned with those and, um, you know, setting their expectations around the journey in terms of the ESG outcomes of their investments, um, potential portfolio biases, risk and return expectations, etc. So, you know, there's quite a bit to consider. Yeah, clearly. Uh, Sarika, is that similar to, to you at Mercer, some of the challenges you're up against? Absolutely. Uh, a whole range of different ideas. Sustainability is quite broad based. And so asking, a, you know, a client coming to us and saying we'd like a sustainable strategy um, means actually sitting down with them first to then understand what are their overall beliefs, what's their policy, their overall framework to then understand what their definition of sustainability is to then, you know, identify the opportunity set that that best fits them. Um, it's quite interesting, uh, again, that the, the terminology um, can continue to be quite confusing at times. Um, so a client could potentially come to us and say, we'd like an impact strategy, but an impact for them could have a different meaning to 
what other investors might say. So it is very much about understanding their underlying beliefs and philosophy to then provide the right opportunity, um, investment opportunity to them. As we learn more, Jerry, do you think it's getting uh, more confusing out there in the marketplace, not more defined, but actually a little more disparate? Yeah, by all means, there's a level of complexity. But first, let me say thank you uh, to both CityWire as well as Mercer for including me in this event today. And um, complexity certainly permeates the subject matter. The first thing that we realize is that our clients, they want to, whether they are individuals or institutions, they want to live with intentionality. So for us, it really begins by wanting to understand what are they trying to accomplish? And then once we understand what they're trying to accomplish, making sure, making sure that we are providing them with the toolbox of um, options and opportunities that could help them to, to implement uh, whatever that intention is. So when we think of ESG, um, you know, there's, that means so many different things to so many different people. So it could be, um, are, the, are the specific strategies employing an exclusions process? Is it employing a positive tilts process? Is it you know, focusing in on best in class uh, companies that have high sustainability marks? Uh, is it thematic? Is it impact oriented? So there's so many different permutations of this and it really starts with making sure we're all using the same nomenclature to be able to root it back to what are the client's intentions? Yeah, and staying with that, so obviously the market's flooded with these ESG strategies. You know, what in your mind are some of the most important questions to ask the, the portfolio managers, fund managers in this space to, let's face it, avoid the greenwashers? They yeah, can't no, all be good um, at it. no they, they, they can't all be good at it. Um, so what for us, what we do is we have questions that are geared towards the more the micro and granular level and then we have a few that are um i, I would say uh, it, we up level it a bit so um, you know when we're talking with a manager as to what their specific strategy is done we'll ask them questions like have you trimmed or sold out or increased your exposure uh to an asset class due to esg considerations and then we'll ask them specifically which ones so that we can really delve in give us anecdotal examples as to as to what that means because really as uh, as will be self-evident from this conversation and from the previous sessions the devil's in the details um you know another such question that we would pose to a manager would be how would the portfolio have differed if you had not been applying the esg criteria what what would the construct be there what would that look like um then again, under that granular um, category, you'll list five securities in your strategy that had the lowest ESG metrics within that portfolio. Well, why did you include them in the portfolio? Help us to understand what that looks like. And then what we find by, you know, maybe sometimes it might be perceived by the managers as full contact Socratic method, but we do find that it is helpful because we learn from what their thinking process is, as opposed to somebody presenting us with, you know, their, you know, axiomatic principles, really getting into the into the details of the portfolio is, is helpful. The other thing that we find to be of particular import is who within your organization is responsible for ESG. And if you see that there's um, you, you if you have senior management that's involved, it, it helps to um, to show that this is of import to the organization. What type of resources are being employed to educate your team members on ESG? And how are you measuring this? And so, so those are things which when you start to see where they're applying their resources and who are the people who are specifically responsible for these mandates within the organization, it gives you a sense in terms of the priorities they're um, attributing to it. Uh -huh. And, and Sar Sarika, what are the red flags for you when you look at these strategies? What are the things that really turn you off, make you not, not want to recommend a product? Um, 
Yeah, good question. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, similar to Jera, we've got we've got our, our framework in place that, you know, gives us an idea in terms of what we're looking for from portfolio managers. So four key, you know, broad factors, um, idea generation, portfolio construction, implementation, and business management. And again, to Jerry's point, that business management piece, which is the top-down support, really helps to identify how how supportive the business is. Now, increasingly, we're seeing a good degree of managers, you know, providing that top-down um, uh, strategic support that you didn't see five, 10 years ago, where individual investment teams were perhaps highlighting and, and bringing this forward. Um, but in terms of red flags, really, in, in, in addition to looking at these four factors, we take portfolio holdings, um, you know, and understand what the portfolio looks like. And it's, it's very much getting down to understanding why a stock is in the portfolio. You know, give us your investment rationale, give us the investment thesis for this. Um, what are some of the key risks and the key opportunities? What is the, again, what is the thesis behind this from a sustainability perspective or from an impact perspective? And it's just understanding how some of these ideas that are in the portfolio jive with the overall investment philosophy. And I mean, I can't, I can't emphasize enough the, the, you know, the importance of that because we have come across quite a few, um, quite a few managers, you know, who will have, uh, you know, fairly vague philosophy in place, you know, focusing on impact or sustainability, but then you see some of these stocks that are in the portfolio and you say, well, why is that? And it's a very, you know, very, very small percent of that company is doing something that is sustainability oriented, but, uh, but, and that's it. It's not a core part of the business. It doesn't, it doesn't meet or fit with the overall investment philosophy of the strategy and identifying those types of stocks, you know, helps them to, to, to really bring out the potential, you know, the potential for greenwashing um, and, and uh, you know, misunderstanding of what portfolio managers are trying to do. And, and, and Muno, same, same for you, but also thinking about track record, there aren't a lot of funds with, with lengthy histories here. Uh, how important is that? Have you had to adapt in order to meet that demand for these kinds of products? Yeah, I think um, well, some you know some really good points from from Jerry and Sarika there. I think you know good um, you know good fund selection and the ESG space um, requires deep knowledge of funds underlying ESG approaches. So um, you know if you've got detailed questioning around both intentionality and implementation, I think that should give you, um, uh, you know, sort of a um, sufficient confidence to then um, um, d dig a bit deeper and um, maybe sort of, you know, so our, our focus really remains on um, thoroughly understanding fund managers intent and approach. Um, and, you know, we follow that up by analyzing uh, the results in portfolio to ensure that there's consistency with what has been articulated to us. So, um, you know, if we take a thematic ESG fund, for example, and um, and you, as you point out, you know, some of those actually haven't uh, been around for very long. Um, and so there's a lot of, you know, questioning about around the approach that you need to get comfort with. Um, you know, you'll want to know more about the fund's thematic purity, how the investment universe is derived. Um, is there a link to the revenues that are being generated from that theme? Um, what KPIs does the fund have in place in relation to the theme? And can actually, you know, a sustainable outcome be demonstrated to clients? Um, is the manager only concerned with, you know, how the products and services of companies within that investment universe are linked to the theme? Or are they also analyzing, you know, the company's ESG profiles and, um, taking note of controversies that they might be involved in. So, you know, essentially you're looking to see whether um, ESG is consistently embedded into all aspects of investment decision making, um, you know, starting from the outset with a well-developed ESG philosophy, um, making it clear what the fund stands for. Um, and so, you know, we'd look to see sustainability of risks and opportunities influencing um, idea generation, influencing every investment decision, um, and that's consistently reflected in the portfolio. Um, and, you know, just um, to your question around what questions to ask, I think, you know, it's important also to ask questions around engagement and voting, because that seems to come up quite a lot at, at the firm level. But, you know, it's important to understand how these are embedded within the investment process. You know, are they are they truly embedded or is this sort of a, a default firm wide practice that, that takes place on the side? 
just just coming back to your early point, we'll, talk, we'll touch on engagement a bit later, but you talked about themes. Uh, one of the areas there's consensus in this space is around the UN Sustainable Development Goals and how that's driving investment. Uh, Sarika, if, if you've got views on this, you know, how do you think that's actually playing out? Is that creating some opportunities, uh, also some risks outside of the obvious, you know, sin stocks being somewhere you don't really want to go to? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, to put things into perspective, uh, you know, you mentioned right at the beginning, uh, this area has exploded. Um, so just just to just to give a couple of numbers, um, we have a database that houses over 35,000 investment strategies, uh, and this is across over 7,000 asset managers. So fairly, fairly big, fairly comprehensive. Um, of these, only about 5% have some kind of a sustainability theme or sustainable investment focus to them. So, you know, it's still relatively small. Now, this has grown quite a bit from about 2% less than 10 years ago. So it's just putting things into perspective that it is quite small, but absolutely rapidly growing. Um, so you don't think it's SDGs blown out of proportion here? You think, you think it's justified that it's growing? Um, well, I, yeah, I mean, you you know, I think you look at some of the, the, the broader, you know, um, economic and, and market environment, um, some of the big uh, issues, you know, you look at the World Economic Forum, the global risks that are being highlighted, um, the energy transition that's required, the sustainable development goals, and the investment that's needed. It's, it's not surprising to see this, you know, this increase uh, in, um, in investment ideas, you know, that are absolutely trying to focus on, on closing this gap. So I, you know, again, wouldn't be surprised to, to continue to see the increase. I would expect this, inc you know, this to continue increasing. Um, and the SDGs have had a significant impact, um, you know, in terms of ideas, in terms of not just as a broad framework for, you know, existing strategies, but definitely an increase in new impact investment ideas, you know, that are absolutely great gaining um, traction. I think what's also um, interesting from a thematic perspective, what we have seen, um, is a further breakdown of ideas now where you know early i guess earlier uh sorry last you know the last 10 years um a, a good number of ideas were broad sustainability themes you know or primarily uh, environmental focus what you're seeing are more common ideas around individual sdgs so some of the ideas are like healthcare impact gender and equal and inequality um to a lesser extent we're seeing some affordable finance strategies a huge amount of focus on biodiversity and natural capital. So, you know, a number of these ideas that are very much aligned to one or two SDGs, um, you know, that we're, we're seeing, you know, that we're seeing coming out. Um, and I think beyond that, we're also seeing a significant um, opportunity around the engagement on SDGs. And this is not just around the impact strategies, but also broadly speaking, um, asset managers who are engaging with companies to think about and to increase disclosure around the underlying, whether it's aligned to the underlying targets or other um, metrics, but increasing that disclosure that provides some kind of alignment to the SDGs and the and those underlying targets. So that's quite interesting to see. And definitely we've been seeing new ideas around engagement strategies. So not activism, but, you know, that long term engagement that, uh, you know, tries to unlock value over the longer term. Um, in terms of risks, you know, nothing, you know, we've, we've mentioned this before, the greenwashing, definitely a significant area, especially as some strategies, again, claim to be impact when they're not. Um, and I think that's where we have to, you know, the due diligence becomes absolutely essential. And we have to be clear on that intentionality and understanding the materiality of the investments to, to ensure that, yes, this is doing what it says it's doing. Sure. So the the sustainable development goals um, that were uh, passed or uh, promulgated back in 2015 uh, were, I think, a great uh, call to for us to wake up from our collective slumber and realize that there are certain things that we need to make as priorities. And uh, there are 17 of those goals. Uh, rather than kind of going into each one of them, I would just mention, I would highlight a few that you'll see why in a moment. No poverty, zero hunger, affordable and clean energy, reduced inequalities, climate action. So those are all in and of themselves uh, noteworthy and laudable goals. Where it gets to be a little bit cha more challenging, though, is how they interplay 
uh, with each other. And again, going back to the intentionality of our clients, which specific products and, um, and investment strategies focus in on one SGG versus another? You know, just plucked from the headlines today, uh, just in the UK, as an example, energy bills are set to rise by more than 50%. Um, and so, you know, one might say that some of the policies associated with energy um, are, are creating some challenges. As we look to transition from perhaps fossil fuels and those uh, energy sources that, uh, that throw off, uh, you know, more carbons, um, as opposed to sustainable, renewable energy. But those are, there are real implications for people who are living on fixed wages and, and the impact on them, you know, for people who are going to fill up their gas tank or, or their home. So those are things that um, as we talk through and work through these issues with clients and truly understand what their focus is, then we, we tie them back and we connect them back to the the specific products or investment modalities that's most consistent with their priorities. Great, Jerry, I'm honored that you read our media. That's, that's charming. Uh, it's, great, it's great to hear. Um, Amuna, let's touch on some of the themes that we've been taking in the most money. Uh, you mentioned biodiversity and uh, natural capital, Sarika. I know that the ecology funds in Europe, there's sort of three or four which have ballooned in size over the past couple of years to go from relative obscurity, sub a billion to over 10 billion and continue to take new money despite the fact they're closed. At what point do you think it dilutes the theme of some of the what they're trying to do? They sort of, by the end, re resemble sort of quasi tech funds with the, the bent on energy efficiency. Yeah, I mean, as, as Jerry mentioned, the devil is in the details. You do need to dig deep to understand each investment approach um, and, and then the portfolio biases that come with such niche investments. Um, you know, they're, they're not necessarily for everyone. And I think, you know, what's really important is um, the piece around um, setting client expectations. Um, those expectations would be best set um, if, you know, once that understanding of the philosophy the strategy and the portfolio um, are accurate because you know the, the better your understanding of of the approach uh, the more accurate you're going to be able to set those expectations and um, you know arguably I, I guess for some clients these will take a, um, a smaller part of um, their portfolio than others um, you know as we said initially um, there's you know different different sort of ESG views preferences um, and beliefs will dominate you know what which of the you know of the SDGs, if if we're going to um, continue with that, um, you know which of those would be best suited um, to each client's preferences, um, and then you know as a second step, um, as we said, you know understanding the portfolios and you know so some of the sector, um, you know or regional or country biases that would come with those, um, or style biases or market cap, you know there's there's quite a bit um, to understand. Yes, staying with you there, I mean, obviously we think that we know what the UN thinks is important. Uh, regulation comes into earnest in, in Europe here in the SFDR this year, hopefully, if it doesn't get postponed again. What's your take on that? Is it, is it enough? Is it good enough? Are you going to use it as a key criteria? Well, yeah, I mean, there's been um, a number of initiatives on the regulatory um, uh, front to improve um, disclosure of ESG products, but also um, you know, provide some standardized labels in order to help investors understand the sustainability characteristics of their investments, which is, um, you know, somewhat lacking at the moment. Um, so, you know, we have SFDR in the EU, um, as you mentioned, as well as, you know, the EU taxonomy. Um, we've got SDR in the UK, which is still in its early stages, but also, you know, regulators and um, Switzerland, Hong Kong, Singapore, you know, all developing their own regulations and requirements. And so, you know, we're very mindful of those and um, it's part of our industry's journey towards greater transparency, greater consistency in calculating and presenting ESG data. Um, and the hope is, you know, for a more coordinated, um, more scalable effort to monitor and improve sustainability practices and, and outcomes globally. Um, so, you know, that, that should be our target. And uh, Jerry, what's, what's the situation like in the US? I understand obviously it's a bit more nascent out there when it comes to these topics. Who, who are you looking to? You know, is it the SEC? Is it someone else? So I think um, 
uh, to quote or to paraphrase Winston Churchill, he says, you could always count on the Americans to do the right thing uh, after they've tried everything else. Now, you read <laughs> all our kidding media, aside, you quote Churchill, this is great. <laughs> uh, so um, what I would say is that when we take a look at F, um, SFDR in the EU, we think that there's been um, real progress in terms of regulation. Uh, in, in some instances, I think that their reasonable minds may differ in terms of the level of regulation. And do you reach that Gladwell tipping point where perhaps, um, you know, too much of a good thing is no good. Um, but I do believe, though, that there is a, a real interest both um, by the SEC um, as well as the as as well as the DOL in terms of um, taking a hard look at what is an appropriate framework for consideration, if you think about it the way the SEC thinks about it, and I'm I had opportunity to um, to hear Kelly Gibson, who's the director of the SEC's uh, Philadelphia regional office and is in charge of their kind of uh, group that's focused in on ESG, and they have um, quite a few tools that they use now, which is if you first focus in on the issuers, the public companies, it's all about disclosures. And if you then look at the advisors, it's all about the fiduciary responsibility and making sure that what they say they're doing, they're actually doing. So if we think about issuers, in order for the advisors to fulfill their fiduciary responsibility, they need to actually have good information, good data that is being put out there by the issuers, you know, the publicly traded companies in order to be able to work through whatever evaluative selection or retention criteria that they have that's that's proprietary to them. So I think we're moving in the right direction as it relates to the DOL. They had um, uh, the Biden administration had come out uh, in favor of um, uh, removing some of the limitations on being able to um, employ or consider ESG factors, or responsible investment factors, as part of um, assets that are withheld that are held within, um, you know, qualified plans. So I think that that's a step in the right direction. We're in that comment period. It looks like from some of the some of the preliminary feedback, it's it's uh, it's met with a lot of um, positive uh, support, and uh, um, but but. We'll, we'll see what the, the final product looks like. What I'm hearing here is it's, it's very much a bit of a headache, this, this topic. Uh, quick question for, you, for all of you, really. Is it more time intensive assessing an ESG fund than it is a traditional long only portfolio? Yes. Yes, no <laughs> answer. Uh, <Yeah>. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, right. there we go. So it takes up more of your time than necessarily the assets. Uh, well, I mean, we, yeah, we I, just... I, Sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Jerry. So the, um, to the question for us, it really, um, we have all of our normal selection and retention criteria and all the things that we look at when we're building out uh, a portfolio, first understanding what a client's trying to accomplish, then constructing the portfolio, then factoring in our, our thoughts, our perspectives in terms of what the, what all of the, um, uh, appropriate exposures, whether it be international, domestic, um, traditional asset classes, alternative asset classes. And then after you've kind of gone through that part of the equation, then you start to delve into, okay, so we, we have a client who's very keen to, to employ responsible investments as part of their investment implementation. And so we started, um, you know, I want to say back in 2019, we took a hard look at this in earnest and said, you know what, as um, as responsible corporate citizen, we want to do our part. And we think that uh, making ESG investments uh, available to our clients would be important. And so we started off, OK, well, well, where do we even begin? And so we thought, well, um, even though we think that this is a really important thing to do, let's survey our clients and see if they have a keen interest in this. And there was certainly a a sufficient level of critical mass that responded in the affirmative. And then we realized that we didn't think it was made sense to be reinventing the wheel. So we looked at thought leaders uh, in this area. 
uh, we thought that Mercer did an excellent job in terms of uh, some of the uh, work that they had done and, and they had been doing for, for the better part of you know, 15 plus years. And so uh, we started with looking at how they had evaluated some of these uh, particular strategies that we might want to employ in our own particular approach, did our own kind of uh, proprietary due diligence to connect with that, and then we incorporate that. And so that process definitely took some time because from the beginning of when we said we want to do this in 2019 and surveyed our clients and they were in on board, we were then going to work in earnest on it in the first quarter um, uh, of 2020. Of course, there was a little thing called the pandemic that kind of uh, slid our time frame a little bit. And so that moved then to the fourth quarter of 2020, where we were delving into this and ultimately rolled it out for our clients in the first quarter of, um, of 2021. And that's been uh, it's been a great process and clients have been very appreciative of it. That's great. Muna, I saw you wanted to come in on this. I know, um, well, you know, we touched on the various regulatory frameworks that earlier, which are key to stay on top of from a, you know, a definitions and disclosure perspective across different regions. Um, but then, you know, you've got the due diligence um, element um, to, to, um, to, you know, keep on top of as well. So our team, you know, is applying a multi vetted approach, um, carrying out, you know, initially a qualitative evaluation of a fund's ESG considerations, the sustainable investment philosophy philosophy being followed, um, you know, sometimes you've got proprietary ESG frameworks that are used by, you know, portfolio managers to look at as well, any other internal, external ESG resources, voting policies, et cetera, and, um, and then making sure that all of this is, you know, is followed through um, in implementation and, and, and is, you know, being consistently applied within the portfolio um, and looking at, you know, various data sets that go with that as well. Um, but, you know, it's equally important that the fund holds investment merit and, you know, our analysts, um, you know, are always keeping, you know, sight of that, um, you know, assessing a fund, a set of, um, against, you know, a set of other qualitative and quantitative criteria relating more broadly, you know, to the fund group, the investment team more broadly, um, you know, various elements of the process uh, from an operational perspective, et cetera. So, you know, there is um, there is significant um, more work that's being done on sustainable investments over and above um, others. Great. Well, that's it from me on the question front. It's time for you, the audience. I've actually got uh, the first question here, and I said we'd get to engagement, and it is on engagement. Um, let's let's talk about divestment. You know, I Sarah, I'll bring you in here. Is it simply excluding something um, uh, going to make the problem better? Um, what are your feelings on the approach to engagement? Is the question. Yeah, I, I mean, on divestment, it, it doesn't necessarily address the underlying issue. Um, I think our view has always been that stewardship helps the realization of long term shareholder value um, that provides investors with an opportunity to enhance not just the companies, but also the markets as well. Um, now, you could take climate transition as an example. As investors are increasingly making their net zero commitments, engagement has to be a key consideration in this, you know, and how the world and companies are going to transition to a more sustainable and low carbon economy. Now, while these commitments can potentially lead to asset managers and asset owners to divest from companies um, such that, you know, they end up with a net zero or a, por um, a Paris aligned portfolio, you know, within the time frame that they're looking at, it doesn't necessarily do much in terms of reducing real world emissions if you're not addressing the underlying issue, which is engaging with those companies that have the potential and the capacity to transition to work with them to develop a strategy that is net zero aligned. So what so are you looking in for this from case, the asset managers here? I mean, we've obviously seen some big talk from BlackRock in this space, world's largest asset manager. Do you think it's enough? Are you seeing, is it more than lip service on engagement? There has to be, right. So there has to be a, um, so we're looking for climate policies. We're looking for very clear climate policies around, you know, what is your view on this? How are you engaging with the companies? We're looking for an engagement agenda. Um, it is coming, uh, you know, and, and science-based targets are very much, you know, again, being a, a key part of this. Um, establishing those that are verified, having companies set these means there is, clear accountability on these companies to, to be, you know, reducing emissions on an annual basis, which means investors, asset managers uh, who are engaging with these companies um, 
should be ensuring that the companies are then aligned to that net zero pathway based on these science-based targets. Now with managers um, having that climate policy in place or any broad um, policy in place should be accompanied by then an engagement agenda. And there should be a link between that engagement agenda and the voting actions. So how have you, you know, it's not just about engaging with companies, but how have you voted on them? Now, again, a, a straightforward no, you know, vote against management is not, it, again, it's not clear cut. It is un about understanding the engagement that does take place. It's about understanding the time frame of the asset manager as well. You know, and engagement is about long term. You can't just expect them to, you know, to, to, to align to your, um, your wants or your asks, you know, within a quarter or so. So it is very much a long term time frame. But you're also then looking for those milestones. You know, what is the progress on this? How have you gained, you know, further engaged with the company? What is your action plan if this doesn't happen? And and having that clear um, linkage between those engagement agendas and that voting action really highlights then the value of what the asset manager is trying to bring to the table. Great. Jerry, any thoughts on this? Probably. <laughs> sure. Um, so we started, we started off this conversation talking about intentionality, and it really comes back to what specifically is the, is the client trying to accomplish. So um, for some of our clients who really want to see their portfolios uh, aligned with their values, they may have very uh, strong feelings uh, about having certain things within that within that portfolio. Um, we have uh, one client that we're engaged with that were that was built very strongly, for example, about having private prisons and not having any private prison exposure within their portfolio. Um, and then you'll have others that are that feel very strongly about not having fossil fuel exposure. Um, and, and we have the ability to to tailor portfolios uh, whether it be with commingled strategies or direct indexing solutions, we have the ability to be able to tailor it to those specific um, the, those specific clients' needs. But uh, I think as Sarika was suggesting that the advocacy and the uh, and the ability to really engage uh, with management and to see where are they going with their you know what what are the voting um, uh, how are they voting their specific, you know, proxies? What are the things that are happening from a management perspective in terms of priorities? I think that we collectively have um, a greater ability to impact for the better and for change by doing that as opposed to just saying, well, I'm going to divest from A, B, and C. Because guess what? If in, 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 uh, in the uh, off chance that we were to all stop holding any sort of um, oil company stock, uh, I promise you that they will continue to be held privately. And then we will have much less control in terms of what actually they're doing. So I think that there's a balance and there's a give and take. I don't think there's any sort of definitive rights or wrongs. Um, but, but in terms of being intentional and tying back what a client is trying to accomplish with their portfolio, there are, there are ways to accomplish that. Great. Thanks for that. Uh, coming into sort of topic of divestment, um, uh, Moon, I'll come to you here. The next question is on uh, passive plays in this space. Do you think it's right to employ them? I mean, obviously, you are divesting naturally by picking up one of those. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, investing passively could be a preferred option um, for some clients, particularly, um, you know, um, sort of within certain sub-asset classes, let's say, or active managers, uh, might have struggled on average. So, you know, um, perhaps slightly irrespective of, of the ESG considerations. So, um, you know, but understanding the index methodology is is paramount, again, because there's, you know, the methodology differs across different index providers and, and even within, you know, within certain providers, different products are following different methodologies and different levels of, um, um, stringency in applying ESG filters um, that then define, you know, the um, the underlying holdings within those indices, and um, and actually, you know, the tighter regulation around ESG benchmarks that um, has come recently, say with the with the EU's um, uh, 
a sustainable finance plan, uh, for example, you know, is very much welcome. Um, it's driven greater product innovation, but also greater uh, transparency, particularly for the you know climate related products. Um, so you know that there is there is a definitely a place for passives uh, within some client portfolios. Great, Sarah, I saw you nodding there. What asset classes do you think passive works? Is it just the standard global equities, U.S. equities, anything that contains U.S. equities? Yeah, <laughs> um, I think there are probably a range of areas where you know where where passive could work. I think you know just just thinking about sort of the broader um, sustainable investment landscape and and the explosion of of indexation there, it has you know become a lot more active in terms of the rules um, and the, the the components that are are leading to that index index approach. Um, this is one area where you know we do think that you know clients who are cost constrained, um, these types of indices definitely provide uh, a good you know broad market exposure uh, with that additional ESG focus and such. But where cost is not a constraint, then uh, investors should definitely be thinking about um, actively managed strategies to to really integrate and allocate um, ESG and sustainability. And again, it comes down to you know the index methodology is different. The, um, the 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 underlying ESG data is also quite different. And I think we're all aware of you know the the lack of or limited correlation amongst data providers and their ESG scores. Um, and so it is about investors and being comfortable with the methodology, the approach that the data providers have to, to building their ESG scores, which then, you know, lead to uh, developing the index. And this could this could differ quite significantly with um, and amongst uh, different um, indexes. A real minefield out there. Great. Thanks so much for, for the response. Well, unfortunately, we need to wrap it up there. Muna, Sarika, Jerry, thank you so much for the lively conversation. Uh, if you missed any of the previous session or this session and want to catch up, they should be live on the website you're viewing this from. Also, please participate in Mercer's Global Wealth Management Survey, which you can find in the Additional Resources tab. It covers everything from asset allocation, market trends, alternatives, business strategy, and of course, sustainability. Uh, please don't forget to fill out also your feedback forms for this session and the event as a whole. Lastly, on behalf of CityWire and Mercer, thank you so much for tuning in, and I'll see you next time.